right. This is the introduction to ecology. Um, this is chapter 18 in your book, or part of it at least. Um, the ecology of organisms. These were the standards that went along with it. Predict how global climate change, human activity, geological events, and the introduction of non-native species impact an ecosystem. Um, interdependence is the name of the whole standard. So that should tell you that the main idea, the main goal of this standard is to get you to understand that we're all interconnected. Not just in food webs like I've shown here, but um, in all sorts of ways. The activities of humans impact um, other organisms. Other organisms depend on each other for food. Um, and other sorts of relationships, which is what this section is all about. So here's the textbook definition of interdependence. Pretty, pretty basic um, and hopefully sort of common sense. Um, a quick review of biotic and abiotic. You will need to know these terms for the EOC, um, and you'll need to know more than just their definitions. You're going to have to be able to apply them. So. Um, biotic means living, bio meaning living, um, so all the living components of the environment. Abiotic, um, you put an A in front of a prefix like that and it means not, so not living. These are all the non-living components. Um, these are the environment's physical and chemical characteristics. Um, it's easy to just say that things like the rocks and temperature uh, and the, the climate in general, the amount of water, all of those things are non-living. But you also have to look at the chemical characteristics. So be aware of things like the amount of um, phosphorus in the soil, the amount of nitrogen in the soil, um, the amount of salt, things like that can certainly affect an organism and have an impact as well. Um, organisms change within their habitat, um, and their habitats are constantly changing. So how does an organism survive if its environment is always changing? Well, if you go back to those characteristics of life, one of the things that we determine makes some is a characteristic, excuse me, of living things, is that every living thing responds to changes in its environment. So that's where this comes into to play. So within that change in the environment, um, every organism has a specific range um, of environmental conditions in which it can live. Some organisms, um, the main um, environmental factor has to do with temperature. Some of them can live in the desert, some of them cannot. Um, polar bears and penguins can stand the cold temperatures, whereas um, other organisms that live in the rainforest, such as tropical birds and things like that, would not be able to survive within those temperatures. So what scientists and ecologists have done is created a tolerance curve um, for organisms. And this is a graph. And this graph shows the performance of an organism um, in a variety of different environmental conditions. Now these environmental variables are usually abiotic factors. I've mentioned temperature already, which is an abiotic factor. So here's a, a tolerance curve, and here's how you read them. This is what's called a standard bell curve. And in a bell curve, it kind of looks like a bell because most of the population is going to end up right in the middle. And this is known as optimum conditions. So for whatever environmental factor you're looking at, it could be temperature, it could be amount of water, it could be the amount of phosphorus available, it could be the amount of nitrogen available. Whatever the abiotic factor is, every species has an optimum range. And what that means is that um, more organisms can exist and survive in this area, right here, than in the other zones of stress. So looking at temperature for these butterflies, let's say their optimum temperature is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That would be nice, right? It, the actual zone of temperature's optimal range is probably closer to 75 or 80, but so let's go with 75. Let's say the optimal range is about 75. As you move up 
the environmental gradient. So as the temperature gets warmer, at some point, the butterflies will begin to be stressed because of the temperature. It becomes too hot. Um, and when you reach another temperature, um, the species can't survive. The same is true on the other end. As the species encounters temperatures that are cooler, less and less of them are able to survive. And then as it gets really cold, they don't survive at all. Um, so if you notice on here, it doesn't really tell you what the abiotic factor is because the tolerance curve looks like this for every species. Now the optimum point is what changes. So looking at our butterflies, we said this was about 75 degrees, but if we changed these butterflies to penguins, the optimal temperature would not be 75 degrees. Um, it would probably be closer to um, freezing, but the curve would still look the same. So here's a tolerance curve, um, and actually it applies to growth rate, percentage per day, um, for different types of fish, and they have them labeled here at different temperatures. So the higher the, the peak of the curve, this little guy right here is the highest. This is letter F, so we'll go down here and look. This is the brook trout. He has a growth rate of about 4.5% per day. So he grows at about 4.5% per day when the temperature is somewhere around 13.5, 14 degrees Celsius. Okay? Um, that means that's optimum for him. Oh, sorry, go back. Um, that means that's an optimum level for that fish. Now, some of these fish have a very wide tolerance curve, so um, this one right here, letter H, the emerald shiner, it can survive in cooler water. It looks like it's about 7 degrees, 6 degrees maybe. It can survive and it will have some growth because it's on this chart, but as the temperature gets warmer, its growth rate increases. Um, so it, it can survive in a lot of different temperatures. This one up here can only survive, this is G, the bluegill. This fish can only survive in warmer temperatures. So that's how you look at a, at a graph like this. All right, so can a species change its tolerance curve? Can the butterflies get used to warmer temperatures? And honestly, it depends on the species, but a lot of a lot of species of organisms can acclimate. You've probably heard this term before, and you've probably used it incorrectly. <laughs> um, an organism can change in response to a change in its environment. So you can acclimate to different temperatures in different situations. Um, the example I give here is, there's, there I am, and there's my husband. We went to Pikes Peak. Um, in Colorado, we went to the top of the mountain at 14,110 feet. Now, there's not a lot of oxygen at those elevations, and, well, there's less oxygen, so your, your body has a harder time. You have to breathe more heavily and more often because it's not getting as much oxygen with each breath. Now, a lot of people get altitude sickness, and what that means is because their bodies aren't getting as much oxygen in each breath as they did at lower elevations, some people may get dizzy, they may black out, um, a lot of people feel nauseous, and one thing they have at the top of Pikes Peak is they have um, lots of places to sit down so people can catch their breath. Um, they also have paramedics on, on hand in case people do black out. They can make sure nothing happens. Um, but if you live, if you spend a lot of time at an altitude like this, your body will acclimate. So there's actually physical changes that occur with acclimation. Um, in this case, your body will actually produce more red blood cells. So your blood is actually packed with more red blood cells so that it can capitalize on every little bit of oxygen that it can get. If you spend a lot of time at this altitude, 
and your body makes lots and lots of red blood cells, which takes a couple of days at least. Um, and then you go back down to a lower altitude. You're going to feel like the air is thick and heavy, and it's going to be sort of the opposite of altitude sickness. You'll definitely notice it. But within a couple of days to a week, you'll acclimate back to the higher levels of oxygen, and the number of red blood cells in your blood will decrease. So that's what we mean by acclimation. There's actually a physical change. Um, so that's an example of how a species can change its tolerance curve. And it's just a little bit. We're not talking about penguins being able to live in the desert through acclimation. Some things are just beyond the range of the organism's physical body to do. But small changes, um, most species can acclimate. All right. So internal conditions. We've been talking about external conditions such as temperature, um, oxygen levels, things like that. Well, all of those things impact your internal conditions as well. And there are two ways that organisms deal with these changes to the internal conditions. The first one um, are called conformers. Um, and these guys conform to the outside changes. They don't regulate their internal conditions. So they conform to their environment. They must remain in their optimal range um, of tolerance to survive. So a good example is cold-blooded um, animals. They must remain in, you know, the lizards go sit on the warm rock to warm themselves up and get their body temperature um, to increase so that it can um, do some of the metabolic processes. And so they're not able to regulate those internal conditions. Those that do are called regulators. So regulators will use energy. Think about, since we're warm-blooded animals, our body temperature remains pretty constant. Um, and in order to do that, we have to use energy. It doesn't just magically happen. Um, and because because we can use energy to regulate our internal conditions, we have a wider tolerance range or a wider tolerance curve than conformers do. Now, it's important to note that an organism can be a conformer in one area and a regulator in another area. So, um, cold-blooded animals are conformers when it comes to temperature, but they may be regulators when it comes to um, the amount of water that's in their system. So you have to be very careful and look at the specific abiotic factor that they're talking about and decide whether or not that organism can regulate that um, abiotic factor or not because organisms are often both depending on the abiotic factor. And that's it for the introduction to ecology. So that's a little bit about how organisms interact um, with their external conditions.